Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Tom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we get on with the show, I need to take a minute to thank everyone who has been listening to Sleepy Time Tales since it started back in 2019. Those people have listened, shared, and supported the show in many wonderful and kind ways. This weird little podcast is still around, thanks to you. It's thanks to your support, dear friend and listener, that Sleepy Time Tales has reached new hearts, and we can go a lot further. Simply by spreading the word, you can help me in my mission to give more people a restful night's sleep, to do my small part, to do our small part and improving their lives. If you tell people on social media, please make sure to tag me in, that's at Sleepy Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter, so that I can see and I can thank you. But even if you just tell the people in your life who are looking a little bit sleepy and uh, cranky, that's really all that, uh, all that Sleepy Time Tales needs. And if you'd like to support Sleepy Time Tales to help me keep it ad-free and going out to thousands of insomniacs just like you, please consider supporting it on Patreon at patreon.com slash sleepytimetales. This is a monthly support that not only helps me keep the lights on, but can also get you fun bonuses based on how much you contribute. I've updated some of the monthly bonuses. The mini sewed short stories that go out every week to $5 patrons have become poetry readings, and I think they're going quite nicely. This month we're doing Walt Whitman, and last month was Emily Dickinson. So if you'd like to catch up on those, take a look. That's patreon.com slash sleepytimetales. But you can contribute to anything and they, you also get early releases uh, if you contribute $2 a month. So if you want to hear next week's episode a few days early, that's an option for you there too. And if monthly seems a big ask, then you can make once-off tips through buymeacoffee.com slash sleepytimetales or the tip jar on the website gone on a bit long so I'm just going to shout out the music which is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiko the music is available on their website at loyaltyfreakmusic.com and let's get back to the show so what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales what is it for what is this strange idea this podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to but lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century and this is a podcast Intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night. Or sometimes background noise, or maybe even just company. That's why I make these episodes quite long. So that I'm here for you without any pressure of the end coming. Now as far as I know there are a couple of different ways to engage. The primary idea with Sleepy Time Tales is that it gives you something to focus on. A story or an event that lets you keep your mind on a specific point to stop it from spinning out into stress and anxiety. To help you to focus just enough not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep. But maybe your needs is a little bit different. Maybe you just need some kind of background. There's people who need the sound of the rain or ocean or wind in the trees. Or maybe just some boring dude droning on in the background. But whether you're actually paying attention or just having it go there with you not having to listen, the important thing is you don't try to force the sleep. 
just keep a light mental thread on the story and allow the need for sleep to come for you. Now obviously I'm hopeful that you'll be asleep before we get to the end of the episode, but it is important that you don't feel pressurized. Especially if this is your first night. The odds are pretty good this actually won't work for you. It'll probably take a good two, probably three nights to get used to it. To the strangeness of the idea. To listening to my voice as I talk. Or maybe one episode isn't long enough. Because maybe your problem isn't so much going to sleep. Maybe you're one of those who wake up in the middle of the night. What I recommend is that you download a whole bunch of episodes. Put them in a playlist and just let them go. That way if you wake up at 3am, that period of the night where you're not quite awake, not quite asleep, you can just pop your buds back in and go back to sleep again. You can even do the same sort of thing if you wake up 60 minutes or 30 minutes before your alarm. It may sound strange, it may seem a bit pointless, what good is an extra 30 minutes of sleep? But there is something about that that is just satisfying on a whole new level. Allowing yourself perfect relaxation right before your alarm. It's just so, so satisfying. And it's important that as you listen, you try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this will probably seem strange to you. So give it a chance. Because I'm here to work with you. To create a safe space. A cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. This week we return once again to Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter 9 Meg goes to Vanity Fair. I do think it was the most fortunate thing in the world that these children should have measles just now, said Meg, one April day as she stood packing the go broadie trunk in her room, surrounded by her sisters. And so nice of Annie Moffat not to forget her promise. A whole fortnight of fun will be regularly splendid, replied Jo, looking like a windmill as she folded skirts with her long arms. In such lovely weather, I'm so glad of that, added Beth, tidily sorting neck and hair ribbons in her best box, lent for the great occasion. I wish I was going to have a fine time and wear all these nice things, said Amy, with a mouth full of pins, as she artistically replenished her sister's cushion. I wish you were all going, but as you can't, I shall keep my adventures to tell you when I come back. I'm sure it's the least I can do when you have been so kind. Lending me things and helping me get ready, said Meg, glancing around the room at the very simple outfit, which seemed nearly perfect in their eyes. What did Mother give you out of the treasure box, asked Amy, who had not been present at the opening of a certain cedar chest in which Mrs. March kept a few relics of past splendor, as gifts for her girls when the proper time came. A pair of silk stockings, that pretty carved fan, and a lovely blue sash. I wanted the violet silk, but there isn't time to make it over, so I must be contented with my old toilet on. It will look nice over my new muslin skirt, and the sash will set it off beautifully. I wish I hadn't smashed my coral bracelet. For you might have had it, said Joe, who loved to give and lend, but whose possessions were usually too dilapidated to be of much use. There is a lovely old-fashioned pearl set in the treasure chest, but Mother said real flowers were the prettiest ornament for a young girl, and Laurie promised to send me all I want, replied Meg. Now, let me see. There's my new grey walking suit. Just curl up the feather in my hat, Beth. Then my poplin for Sunday and the small party. It looks heavy for spring, doesn't it? The violet silk would be so nice, so oh dear. Never mind, you've got the tarlatan for the big party, and you always look like an angel in white, said Amy, brooding over the little store of finery in which her soul delighted. 
It isn't low necked and it doesn't sweep enough, but it will have to do. My blue house dress looks so well, turned and freshly trimmed, that I feel as if I'd got a new one. My silver sack isn't a bit the fashion, and my bonnet doesn't look like Sally's. I don't like to say anything, but I was sadly disappointed in my umbrella. I told Mother Black with a white handle, but she forgot and bought a green one with a yellowish handle. It's strong and neat, so it's not to complain, but I know I shall feel ashamed of it besides any silk one with a gold top, sighed Meg, surveying the little umbrella with great disfavour. Change it, advised Joe. I won't be so silly or hurt Mommy's feelings when she took so much pains to get my thing. It's a nonsensical notion of mine and I'm not going to give up to it. My silk stockings and two pairs of new gloves are my comfort. You are dear to lend yours, Joe. I feel so rich and sort of elegant with two new pairs, and the old ones cleaned up for common. And Meg took a refreshing peep at her glove box. Annie Moffat has blue and pink bows on her nightcaps. Would you put some on mine, she asked, as Beth brought up a pile of snowy muslins fresh from Hannah's hands. No, I wouldn't, for the smart caps won't match the plain gowns without any trimming on them. Poor folks shouldn't rig, said Joe decidedly. I wonder if I shall ever be happy enough to have real lace on my clothes and bows on my caps, said Meg impatiently. You said the other day you'd be perfectly happy if you could only go to Annie Moffat's, observed Beth in her quiet way. So I did. Well, I am happy, and I won't fret, but it does seem as if the more one gets, the more one wants, doesn't it? There now, the trays are ready and everything in but my ball dress, which I shall leave for mother to pack, said Meg, cheering up as she glanced from the half-full trunk to the many times pressed and mended white tarlatan, which she called her ball dress with an important air. The day was fine, and Meg departed in style for a fortnight of novelty and pleasure. Mrs. March had consented to the visit rather reluctantly, fearing that Margaret would come back more discontented than she went. But she begged so hard, and Sally had promised to take good care of her, and a little pleasure seemed so delightful after a winter of irksome work that the mother yielded, and the daughter went to take her first taste of fashionable life. The Moffats were very fashionable, and simple Meg, rather daunted, at first by the splendour of the house and the elegance of its occupants. But they were kindly people, in spite of the frivolous life they led, and soon put their guest at her ease. Perhaps Meg felt, without understanding why, that they were not particularly cultivated or intelligent people and that all their gilding could not quite conceal the ordinary material of which they were made. It certainly was agreeable to fare sumptuously, drive in a fine carriage, wear her best frock every day and do nothing but enjoy herself. It suited her exactly, and soon she began to imitate the manners and conversation of those about her, to put on little airs and graces and use French phrases, crimp her hair, take in her dresses, and talk about the fashions as well as she could. The more she saw of Annie Moffat's pretty things, the more she envied her and sighed to be rich. Home now looked bare and dismal as she thought of it. Work grew harder than ever, and she felt that she was a very destitute and much injured girl, in spite of the new gloves and silk stockings. She had not much time for repining, however, for the three young girls were busily employed in having a good time. They shopped, walked, rode, and called all day, went to theatres and operas or frolicked at home in the evening, for Annie had many friends and knew how to entertain them. Her older sisters were very fine young ladies, and one was engaged, which was extremely interesting and romantic. Meg thought Mr. Moffat was a fat, jolly old gentleman who knew her father, and Mrs. Moffat a fat, jolly old lady who took as great a fancy to Meg as her daughter had done. 
Everyone petted her, and Daisy, as they called her, was in a fair way to have her head turned. When the evening for the small party came, she found that the poplin wouldn't do at all, for the other girls were putting on thin dresses and making themselves very fine indeed. So out came the tarlatan, looking older, limper and shabbier than ever besides Sally's crisp new one. Meg saw the girls glance at it and then at one another, and her cheeks began to burn, for with all her gentleness she was very proud. No one said a word about it, but Sally offered to dress her hair and Annie to tie her sash, and Belle, the engaged sister, praised her white arms. But in their kindness, Meg saw only pity for her poverty, and her heart felt very heavy as she stood by herself, while the others laughed, chattered, and flew about like gauzy butterflies. The hard, bitter feeling was getting pretty bad when the maid brought in a box of flowers. Before she could speak, Annie had the cover off, and all were exclaiming at the lovely roses, heath and fern within. It's for Belle, of course. George always sends her some, but these are altogether ravishing, cried Annie with a great sniff. They are for Miss March, the man said, and here's a note, put in the maid, holding it to Meg. What fun, who are they from? Didn't know you had a lover, cried the girls, fluttering about Meg in a high state of curiosity and surprise. The note is from Mother and the flowers from Laurie, said Meg simply, yet much gratified that he had not forgotten her. Oh, indeed, said Annie with a funny look, as Meg slipped the note into her pocket as a sort of talisman against envy, vanity and false pride. For the few loving words had done her good, and the flowers cheered her up by their beauty. Feeling almost happy again, she laid by a few ferns and roses for herself, and quickly made up the rest in dainty bouquets for the breasts, hair or skirts of her friends, offering them so prettily that Clara, the elder sister, told her she was the sweetest little thing she ever saw, and they looked quite charmed with her small attention. Somehow the kind act finished her despondency, and while all the rest went to show themselves to Mrs. Moffat, she saw a happy, bright-eyed face in the mirror, as she laid her ferns against her rippling hair, and fastened the roses in the dress that didn't strike her as so very shabby now. She enjoyed herself very much that evening, for she danced to her heart's content. Everyone was very kind, and she had three compliments. Annie made her sing, and someone said she had a remarkably fine voice. Major Lincoln asked who the fresh little girl with the beautiful eyes was and Mr. Moffat insisted on dancing with her, because she didn't dawdle but had some spring in her, as he gracefully expressed it. So altogether she had a very nice time, till she overheard a bit of conversation which disturbed her extremely. She was sitting just inside the conservatory, waiting for her partner to bring her an ice, when she heard a voice ask on the other side of the flowery wall, How old is he? Sixteen or seventeen, I should say, replied another voice. It would be a grand thing for one of those girls, wouldn't it? Sally says they are very intimate now, and the old man quite dotes on them. Mrs. M has made her plans, I dare say, and will play her cards well, early as it is. The girl evidently doesn't think of it yet, said Mrs. Moffat. She told that fib about her mama, as if she did know, and coloured up when the flowers came quite prettily. Poor thing. She would be so nice if she were only got up in style. Do you think she'd be offended if we offered to lend her a dress for Thursday? asked another voice. She's proud, but I don't believe she'd mind. For that dowdy tarlatan was all she's got. She may tear it tonight, and that will be a good excuse for offering a decent one. Here Meg's partner appeared. 
to find her looking much flushed and rather agitated. She was proud, and her pride was useful just then, for it helped her hide her mortification, anger and disgust at what she had just heard. For, innocent and unsuspicious as she was, she could not help understanding the gossip of her friends. She tried to forget it, but she could not, and kept repeating to herself, Mrs. M has made her plans, that fib about her mama, and that dowdy Tarleton, till she was ready to cry and rush home to tell her troubles and ask for advice. As that was impossible, she did her best to seem gay, and being rather excited, she succeeded so well that no one dreamed what an effort she was making. She was very glad when it was all over and she was quiet in her bed, where she could think and wander and fume till her head ached, and her hot cheeks were cooled by a few natural tears. Those foolish yet well-meant words had opened a new world to Meg, and much disturbed the peace of the old one in which till now she had lived happily as a child. Her innocent friendship with Laurie was spoiled by the silly speeches she had overheard. Her faith in her mother was a little shaken by the worldly plans attributed to her by Mrs. Moffat, who judged others by herself, and the sensible resolution to be contented with the simple wardrobe which suited a poor man's daughter was weakened by the unnecessary pity of girls who thought a shabby dress one of the greatest calamities under heaven. Poor Meg had a restless night and got up heavy-eyed, unhappy, half resentful towards her friends and half ashamed of herself for not speaking out frankly and setting everything right. Everybody dawdled that morning and it was noon before the girls found energy enough even to take up their worsted work. Something in the manner of her friends struck Meg at once. They treated her with more respect, she thought took quite a tender interest in what she said and looked at her with eyes that plainly betrayed curiosity. All this surprised and flattered her, though she did not understand it, till Miss Bell looked up from her writing and said with a sentimental air, Daisy, dear, I've sent an invitation to your friend Mr. Lawrence for Thursday. We should like to know him and it's only a proper compliment to you. Meg coloured, but a mischievous fancy to tease the girls came and replied demurely. You are very kind, but I'm afraid he won't come. Why not, Cherie? asked Miss Bell. He's too old. My child, what do you mean? What is his age, I beg to know, cried Miss Clara. Nearly seventy, I believe, answered Meg, counting stitches to hide the merriment in her eyes. You sly creature. Of course we meant the young man, exclaimed Miss Bell, laughing. There isn't any. Laurie is only a little boy. And Meg laughed also at the queer look which the sisters exchanged, as she thus described her supposed lover. About your age, Nan said. Nearer my sister Joe's. I'm seventeen in August, returned Meg, tossing her head. It's very nice of him to send you flowers, isn't it, said Annie, looking wise about nothing. Yes, he often does, to all of us, for their house is full and we are so fond of them. My mother and old Mr. Lawrence are friends, you know, so it's quite natural that we children should play together. And Meg hoped they would say no more. It's evident Daisy isn't out yet, said Miss Clara to Belle with a nod. Quite a pastoral state of innocence all round, returned Miss Belle with a shrug. I'm going out to get some little matters for my girls. Can I get anything for you, young ladies? asked Mrs. Moffat, lumbering in like an elephant in silk and lace. No, thank you, ma'am, replied Sally. I've got my new pink silk for Thursday and won't want a thing. Nor I, began Meg, but stopped, because it occurred to her that she did want several things and could not have them. What shall you wear? asked Sally. My old white one again, if I can mend it fit to be seen. It got sadly torn last night, said Meg, trying to speak quite easily, but feeling very uncomfortable. Why don't you send home for another, said Sally, who was not an observing young lady. 
I haven't got any other. It cost Meg an effort to say that, but Sally did not see it and exclaimed in amiable surprise. Only that? How funny. She did not finish her speech, for Belle shook her head at her and broke in, saying kindly, Not at all. Where is the use of having a lot of dresses when she isn't out yet? There's no need of sending home, Daisy, even if you had a dozen, for I've got a sweet blue silk laid away which I've outgrown, and you shall wear it to please me, won't you, dear? You are very kind, but I don't mind my old dress if you don't. It's well enough for a little girl like me, said Meg. Now do let me please myself by dressing you up in style. I admire her to do it, and you'll be a regular little beauty with a touch here and there. I shan't let anyone see you till you are done. And then we'll burst upon them like Cinderella and her godmother going to the ball, said Belle in her persuasive tone. May couldn't refuse the offer so kindly made, for a desire to see if she could be a little beauty after touching up caused her to accept and forget all her former uncomfortable feelings towards the Moffats. On the Thursday evening, Belle shut herself up with her maid, and between them they turned Meg into a fine lady. They crimped and curled her hair. They polished her neck and arms with some fragrant powder, touched her lips with Coraline's salve to make them redder, and Hortons would have added a sousson of rouge if Meg had not rebelled. They laced her into a sky-blue dress, which was so tight she could hardly breathe, and so low in the neck that modest Meg blushed at herself in the mirror. A set of silver filigree was added, bracelets, necklace, brooch, and even earrings. Hortense tied them on with a bit of pink silk, which did not show. A cluster of tea rose buds at the bosom and a ruche reconciled Meg to the display of her pretty white shoulders, and a pair of high-heeled silk boots satisfied the last wish of her heart. A lace handkerchief, a plumy fan, and a bouquet in the shoulder holder finished her off and Miss Bell surveyed her with the satisfaction of a little girl with a newly dressed doll. Mademoiselle Charmant, Trejolie, is she not? cried Hortense, clasping her hands in affected rapture. Come and show yourself, said Miss Bell, leading the way to the room where the others were waiting. As Meg went rustling after, with her long skirts trailing, her earrings tinkling, her curls waving, and her heart beating, she felt as if her fun had really begun at last. For the mirror had plainly told her that she was a little beauty. Her friends repeated the pleasing phrase enthusiastically, and for several minutes she stood, like a jackdaw in the fable, enjoying her borrowed plumes while the rest chattered like a party of magpies. While I dressed Eugel her nan in the management of her skirt and those French heels, or she'll trip herself up. Take your silver butterfly and catch up that long curl on the left side of her head, Clara, and don't any of you disturb the charming work of my hands, said Belle, as she hurried away, looking well pleased with her success. You don't look a bit like yourself, but you're very nice. I'm nowhere beside you, for Belle has heaps of taste, and you're quite French. I assure you. Let your flowers hang, don't be so careful of them, and be sure you don't trip, returned Sally, trying not to care that Meg was prettier than herself. Keeping that warning carefully in mind, Margaret got safely downstairs, and sailed into the drawing rooms where the Moffats and a few early guests were assembled. She very soon discovered that there's a charm about fine clothes, which attracts a certain class of people and secures their respect. Several young ladies who had taken no notice of her before were very affectionate all of a sudden. Several young gentlemen who had only stared at her the other party now not only stared but asked to be introduced and said all manner of foolish but agreeable things to her. And several old ladies who sat on the sofas criticised the rest of the party and inquired who she was with an air of interest. She heard Mrs. Moffat reply to one of them, Daisy March, father a colonel in the army and one of the first families, 
but reverses a fortune, you know. Intimate friends of the Lawrences, sweet creature, I assure you, my Ned is quite wild about her. Dear me, said the old lady, putting up a glass for another observation of Meg, who tried to look as if she had not heard and been rather shocked at Mrs. Moffat's fibs. The queer feeling did not pass away, but she managed in herself acting the new part of a fine lady, and so got on pretty well, though the tart dress gave her a side ache. The train kept getting under her feet, and she was in constant fear lest her earring should fly off and get lost or broken. She was flirting her fan and laughing at the feeble jokes of a young gentleman who tried to be witty, when she suddenly stopped laughing and looked confused. For just opposite she saw Laurie. He was staring at her with undisguised surprise and disapproval also, she thought, for though he bowed and smiled, yet something in his honest eyes made her blush and wish she had her old dress on. To complete her confusion she saw Belle nudge Annie, and both glanced from her to Laurie, who she was happy to see looked unusually boyish and shy. Silly creatures to put such thoughts into my head. I won't care for it or let it change me a bit, thought Meg, and rustled across the room to shake hands with her friend. I'm glad you came. I was afraid you wouldn't, she said, with a most grown-up air. Joe wanted me to come and tell her how you looked, so I did, answered Laurie, without turning his eyes upon her, though he half smiled at her maternal tone. What shall you tell her? asked Meg, full of curiosity to know his opinion of her, yet feeling ill at ease with him for the first time. I shall say I don't know you, for you look so grown up and unlike yourself, I'm quite afraid of you, he said, fumbling at his glove button. How absurd of you. The girls dress me up for fun, and I rather like it. Wouldn't Joe stay if she saw me, said Meg bent on making him say whether he thought her improved or not. Yes, I think she would, returned Laurie gravely. Don't you like me so, asked Meg. No, I don't, was the blunt reply. Why not, in an anxious tone. He glanced at her frizzled head, bare shoulders and fantastically trimmed dress with an expression that abashed her more than his answer which had not a particle of his usual politeness in it. I don't like fuss and feathers. That was altogether too much from a lad younger than herself, and Meg walked away, saying petulantly, You are the rudest boy I ever saw. Feeling very much ruffled, she went and stood at a quiet window to cool her cheeks for the tart dress gave her an uncomfortably brilliant colour. As she stood there, Major Lincoln passed by, and a minute after she heard him saying to his mother, They're making a fool of that little girl. I wanted you to see her, but they've spoiled her entirely. She's nothing but a doll tonight. Oh dear, sighed Meg. I wish I'd been sensible and worn my own things, then I should not have disgusted other people, or felt so uncomfortable and ashamed of myself. She leaned her forehead on the cool pane and stood half hidden by the curtains, never minding that her favourite waltz had begun, till someone touched her and turning she saw Laurie, looking penitent, as he said with his very best bow and his hand out. Please forgive my rudeness and come and dance with me. I'm afraid it'll be too disagreeable to you, said Meg, trying to look offended and failing utterly. Not a bit of it. I'm dying to do it. Come, I'll be good. I don't like your gown, but I do think you're just splendid. And he waved his hands, as if words failed to express his admiration. Meg smiled and relented, and whispered as they stood up waiting to catch the tom. Take care my skirt doesn't trip you up. It's the plague of my laugh, and I was a goose to wear it. Pin it round your neck and then it'll be useful, said Laurie, looking down at the little blue boots which she evidently approved of. 
Away they went, fleetly and gracefully, for having practiced at home they were well matched, and the blithe young couple were a pleasant sight to see as they twirled merrily around and round, feeling more friendly than ever after their small tiff. Laurie, I want you to do me a favour, will you, said Meg, as he stood fanning her when her breath gave out. Which it did very soon, though she would not own why. Won't I, said Laurie with alacrity. Please don't tell them at home about my dress tonight. They won't understand the joke, and it will worry Mother. Then why did you do it, said Laurie's eyes, so plainly that Meg hastily added, I shall tell them myself all about it and confess to mother how silly I've been, but I'd rather do it myself. So you'll not tell, will you? I give you my word I won't. Only what shall I say when they ask me? Just say I looked pretty well and was having a good time. I'll say the first with all my heart, but how about the other? You don't look as if you were having a good time. Are you? And Laurie looked at her with an expression which made her answer in a whisper. No, not just now. Don't think I'm horrid. Only wanted a little fun. But this sort doesn't pay, I find. And I'm getting tired of it. Here comes Ned Moffat. What does he want? said Laurie, knitting his black brows as if he did not regard his young host in the light of a pleasant addition to the party. He put his name down for three dancers, and I suppose he's coming for them. What a bore, said Meg, assuming a languid air, which amused Laurie immensely. He did not speak to her again till supper time, when he saw her drinking champagne with Ned and his friend Fisher, who were behaving like a pair of fools, as Laurie said to himself. For he felt a brotherly sort of right to watch over the marches and fight the battles whenever a defender was needed. You'll have a splitting headache tomorrow if you drink much of that. I wouldn't, Meg, your mother doesn't like it, you know, he whispered, leaning over her chair, as Ned turned to refill her glass and Fisher stooped to to pick up her fan. I'm not Meg tonight. I'm a doll who does all sorts of crazy things. Tomorrow I shall put away my fuss and feathers and be desperately good again, she answered, with an affected little laugh. Wish tomorrow was here then, muttered Laurie, walking off, ill-pleased at the change he saw in her. Meg danced and flirted, chatted and giggled as the other girls did. After supper she undertook the German and blundered through it, nearly upsetting her partner with a long skirt, and romping in a way that scandalised Laurie, who looked on and meditated a lecture but he got no chance to deliver it, for Meg kept away from him till he came to say good night. Remember, she said, trying to smile, for the splitting headache had already begun. Silence a la mort, replied Laurie, with a melodramatic flourish as he went away. This little bit of byplay excited Annie's curiosity, but Meg was too tired for gossip and went to bed feeling as if she had been to a masquerade and hadn't enjoyed herself as much as she expected. She was sick all the next day and on Saturday went home, quite used up with her fortnight's fun and feeling that she had sat in the lap of luxury long enough. It does seem pleasant to be quiet and not have company manners on all the time. Home is a nice place though it isn't splendid, said Meg, looking about her with a restful expression as she sat with her mother and Joe on the Sunday evening. I'm glad to hear you say so, dear, for I was afraid home would seem dull and poor to you after your fine quarters, replied her mother, who had given her many anxious looks that day. For motherly eyes are quick to see any change in children's faces. Meg had told her adventures gaily and said over and over what a charming time she had had but something still seemed to weigh upon her spirits, and when the younger girls were gone to bed, she sat thoughtfully staring at the fire, saying little and looking worried. 
as the clock struck nine and Joe proposed bed. Meg suddenly left her chair and, taking Beth's stool, leaned her elbows on her mother's knee, saying bravely, Mommy, I want to fess. I thought so. What is it, dear? Shall I go away, asked Joe discreetly. Of course not. Don't always tell you everything. I was ashamed to speak of it before the younger children, but I want you to know all the dreadful things I did at the Moffats. We are prepared, said Mrs. March, smiling, but looking a little anxious. I told you they dressed me up, but I didn't tell you that they powdered and squeezed and frizzled and made me look like a fashion plate. Laurie thought I wasn't proper. I know he did, though he didn't say so. And one man called me a doll. I knew it was silly, but they flattered me and said I was a beauty and quantities of nonsense, so I let them make a fool of me. Is that all? asked Joe, as Mrs. March looked silently at the downcast face of her pretty daughter, and could not find it in her heart to blame her little follies. No, I drank champagne and romped and tried to flirt, and was altogether abominable, said Meg, self-reproachfully. There is something more, I think. And Mrs. March smoothed the soft cheek, which suddenly grew rosy as Meg answered slowly. Yes, it's very silly, but I want to tell it, because I hate to have people say and think such things about us and Laurie. Then she told the various bits of gossip she had heard at the Moffats, and as she spoke, Joe saw her mother fold her lips tightly, as if ill pleased that such ideas should be put into Meg's innocent mind. Well, if that isn't the greatest rubbish I ever heard, cried Joe indignantly. Why don't you pop out and tell them so on the spot? I couldn't. It was so embarrassing for me. I couldn't help hearing it first, and then I was so angry and ashamed I didn't remember that I ought to go away. Just wait till I see Annie Moffat and I'll show you how to settle such ridiculous stuff. The idea of having plans and being kind to Laurie because he's rich and may marry us, by and by. Won't he shout when I tell him what those silly things say about us poor children? And Joe laughed, as if on second thoughts the thing struck her as a good joke. If you tell Laurie, I'll never forgive you. She mustn't, must she, mother? Said Meg, looking distressed. No, never repeat that foolish gossip and forget it as soon as you can, said Mrs. March gravely. I was very unwise to let you go among people of whom I know so little. Kind, I dare say, but worldly, ill-bred, and full of those vulgar ideas about young people. I am more sorry than I can express for the mischief this visit may have done you, Meg. Don't be sorry, I won't let it hurt me. I'll forget all the bad and remember only the good, for I did enjoy a great deal, and thank you very much for letting me go. I'll not be sentimental or dissatisfied, mother. I know I'm a silly little girl, and I'll stay with you till I'm fit to take care of myself. But it is nice to be praised and admired, and I can't help saying I like it, said Meg, looking half ashamed of the confession. That is perfectly natural and quite harmless, if the liking does not become a passion and lead one to do foolish or unmaidenly things. Learn to know and value the praise which is worth having and to excite the admiration of excellent people by being modest as well as pretty, Meg. Margaret sat thinking a moment, while Jo stood with her hands behind her, looking both interested and a little perplexed for it was a new thing to see Meg blushing and talking about admiration, lovers, and things of that sort. And Joe felt as if during that fortnight her sister had grown up amazingly, and was drifting away from her into a world where she could not follow. Mother, do you have plans, as Mrs. Moffat said, asked Meg bashfully. Yes, my dear, I have a great many, as all mothers do. But mine differs somewhat from Mrs. Moffat's, I suspect. I will tell you some of them, for the time has come when a word may set this romantic little head and heart of yours right, on a very serious subject. You are young, Meg, but not too young to understand me, and mother's lips are the fittest to speak of such things to girls like you. Joe, your turn will come in time, perhaps, 
so listen to my plans and help me carry them out if they are good. Joe went and sat on one arm of the chair, looking as if she thought they were about to join some very solemn affair. Holding a hand of each and watching the two young faces wistfully, Mrs. March said in a serious yet cheery way, I want my daughters to be beautiful, accomplished and good, to be admired, loved and respected, to have a happy youth, to be well and wisely married, and to lead useful, pleasant lives with as little care and sorrow to try them as God sees fit to send. To be loved and chosen by a good man is the best and sweetest thing which can happen to a woman, and I sincerely hope my girls know this beautiful experience. It is natural to think of it, Meg, right to hope and wait for it, and wise to prepare for it, so that when the happy time comes you may feel ready for the duties and worthy of the joy. My dear girls, I am ambitious for you, but not to have you make a dash in the world, marry rich men merely because they are rich, or have splendid houses which are not homes because love is wanting. Money is a needful and precious thing, and when well used, a noble thing. But I never want you to think it is the first or only prize to strive for. I'd rather see you poor men's wives if you are happy, beloved, contented than queens on thrones without self-respect and peace. Poor girls can't stand any chance, Belle says, unless they put themselves forward, sighed Meg. Then we'll be old maids, said Joe stoutly. Right, Joe. Better be happy old maids than unhappy wives or unmaidenly girls, running about to find husbands, said Mrs. March decidedly. Don't be troubled, Meg. Poverty seldom daunts a sincere lover. Some of the best and most honourable women I know were poor girls, but so love-worthy that they were not allowed to be old maids. Leave these things to time. Make this home happy so that you may be fit for homes of your own if they are offered to you, and contented here if they are not. One thing remember, my girls. Mother is always ready to be your confidant, father to be your friend, and both of us hope and trust that our daughters, whether married or single, will be the pride and comfort of our lives. We will, Mommy, we will, cried both, with all their hearts, as she bade them good night. And that is where I'm going to leave it for tonight. As always, if you'd like to pick up where we've left off, you can find the original on Project Gutenberg at the link in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of CB Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week, but make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiko. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams.